Welcome to Emotional Resilience, Living with the Fruit of the Spirit. I'm your host and author, Ron Ovid, and I'm so glad that you could uh, make it here with us tonight. Tonight we're going to be talking about attachment. We just finished uh, talking about the brain, and now we're going to talk about attachment, and they call it attachment theory. Now, that's a kind of a funky name. It's, it's a word that makes some sense and yet doesn't, and so let me take just a minute to kind of explain it. What we're going to be talking about is the ability for a child to attach emotionally, attach emotionally to their caregivers. It's an important thing, right? It's an important way that we grow, that we nurture, and that we start making assumptions about the world. So when I'm talking about attachments, you know, I'm, I'm talking about an emotional attachment, okay? And so we're gonna be talking about healthy attachments versus unhealthy attachments. Secure, yeah, I feel secure, right, versus non-secure, I don't feel secure. And you can imagine a baby either feels safe with the caregivers or if something's going wrong, they don't. So secure or non-secure. So we'll start with that. But uh, let's just ask God to speak to our hearts and then we'll uh, get going. Father, I thank you for bringing us here. Lord, this is such an important subject. Uh, for many of us, uh, we came from environments where maybe it wasn't as secure as it could have been. And what's that mean, Lord? How, what's, what has that done to, uh, to us? Uh, is there things that need to be adjusted and thought about? Lord, I pray that you'd teach us. And we'll thank you now in your name. Amen. Well, I'm so glad that I can bring this. Uh, you know, you don't hear many churches uh, talking about this. And I want to thank Moraine Valley Church for allowing us to do this here. Uh, we used to fill up this uh, room with about 100 people, but since the pandemic came, uh, we've had to do it uh, via, via video. And I'd like to welcome as well those from Downers Grove, because we used to meet there on Monday nights, and I want to thank you for attending as well tonight. Soon, hopefully soon, we'll be able to get back together. Uh, but right now, we're doing it this way. And, and what we're talking about now is healthy attachments through attunement, through having a good relationship with each other. And we'll talk a little bit about attunement tonight, too. Now, let's review a little bit. We've been spending, what, eight or nine weeks on the brain, and we've learned a lot of things about the brain. And part of the reason was to set up this discussion today, because attachment is such an important thing. And each lesson will add more to this cumulative knowledge, right? But let's review. Remember, we talked about early stages, zero to seven, that a, a baby uh, learns emotionally. They learn everything emotionally. That whole prefrontal cortex where we do our rational thinking, the uh, upper part of that prefrontal cortex doesn't come online to about 12. And what we know is that from about 8 to 11 or 12 there is, is a social learning, which is still emotional. And then you have the more rational learning after that. But, you, you know, this emotional learning sets itself in our brain and in our systems. And unless we change it, it's a learning thing. It's a procedural memory. You know, it's like uh, learning to ride a bike, right? Uh, once you learn it, you don't have to relearn and relearn. Why? Because a bicycle is sort of like this. You get on there and you're, you're, you're balancing. I mean, how do you explain balance, balance? What's that mean, right? And it was like baseball. I had to learn a baseball swing. And they said, keep your eye on the ball. Well, OK, well, you know, you had, you had to naturally learn to do that. And you really understand that when you go from a baseball swing to a golf swing. <laughs> it's a totally different swing. And you have to what? Relearn. You have to unlearn how to swing a baseball bat because a golf is different. And that's kind of really what we're talking about here. You know, we talk about emotional recognition where we recognize our emotions, and, and they're in our body. Emotions are these sensations, right? And then we learn to regulate them. We learn to regulate our emotions. But the key here is that if we don't change things, we're going to always just constantly have to regulate. And, and that's not the optimum way we want to do it. What we want to do is emotionally relearn. And it's just like, uh, okay, I've had, a, I've had a stance that was wrong from golf all this time. I have to relearn it. Have you ever had an employer or someone that says, boy, I'd rather teach someone fresh than have to reteach someone how to do it right? You know, we can pick up these things. We can learn 
uh, false premises about ourself and about life from these early attachments. And then we have to relearn what the truth is where we're not reacting. You know, if, if you thought every time you came in a room and said hi to this certain person, they were going to smack you, <laughs> After a while, what would you feel like when you walked into a room with new people? Would you be going, hi? You know, there'd be this kind of reaction at first, wouldn't it? Because it was a learned, you learned something. People can't be trusted. You can't be friendly. They'll take advantage of you. You know, you, you, you know what I'm talking about. So let's get into it. Let's talk on page one here, healthy attachments through attunement. And this is key to emotional health. Um, now, Caregivers who are available and responsive to the infant's needs allow the child to have the sense of security, okay? And that, that's what attachment is, the secure attachment. So if the caregiver is available, and boy, in today's day and age, with a, both parents working, you know, that's, that's an if sometimes. Available and responsive uh, to infant's needs. And with the epidemic of anxiety and drug addictions, it's not impossible that a caregiver might not be able to be responsive all the time. So we have tons of people out there that have grown up in environments that weren't uh, the, the healthiest for an attachment. Well, Dr. Alan Shore, who really was a prime mover in the, this century anyways, in the in 20, 20, uh, in the 20th uh, century here, he's the one 21st century, he's the one that really took this attachment theory and put some real, uh, real teeth into it for us. Attachment theory, we'll get into in a minute, was written back in the early 1900s by Bowlby in that. But when Alan Shore came along, he in the a decade of the brain, he said, let's do these brain scans. Let's see how the brain reacts to this. And what he found, what he found is that We've been doing therapy as a talk therapy, and that's important. We need to have communication, right? But that really, the things that really get us going, the things that really set us emotionally off are the nonverbal many times. And so he said it's not a talking cure, it's a communication cure, a communication cure. And that's coming from one of the foremost uh, psychological researchers in the world. And he's the creator of what they call affective regulation th theory. And uh, he said that there's a right brain ther therapy now. And we talked about that, remember? The right brain, the left brain, and how the left brain's more rational, right brain's more emotional, and how we really communicate right brain to right brain. And this is all, all new in the last 20 years, and it's... Uh, really makes a lot of sense uh, when, you're, when you're working with people emotionally. With the new studies, he says, in neuroscience, we now know that the right hemisphere of the brain communicates with other right hemispheres. It is a nonverbal communication that has tremendous influence on our behavior. This has huge implications for what we're doing in here in, in emotional resilience. Uh, you see, in Christianity, we're often directive, right? Well, this is what the Bible says, this is what you should do, and we're very directive in our counseling. However, deep and lasting change comes when a person gets their own insight, and when they're blocking a deep emotional state, there's no way uh, that they will share with anyone. And so we need to build trust, and the good thing about uh, Christianity is that we can have that kind of trust and that love for each other. We're commanded to love one another. And we have that whole reparenting thing with God the Father. God's love and our love for each other can really help us communicate, communicate this right brain to right brain. So it's not just talking to people and telling them what they need to do. It's having that empathy and that love and attunement that moves people and gives them insight and gives them um, the ability to trust and the ability to, to move on. And so uh, that's important. And until trust and empathy are made, uh, you know, we won't feel safe. We won't feel safe uh, enough to get in touch with those deep emotions. And there needs to be that trust where a person can really share 
and, and get it out and talk about it. And so uh, this kind of communication, that's what makes the therapeutic process so important. And if you're struggling with issues, I encourage you to find a therapist that really will have this kind of ability to have empathy with you and to have a relationship that's, that's really tuned in so you can feel that safety, you can feel that acceptance, right? That positive self-regard. You can, you can start to feel that they're happy to be with you and they're there and you can build this trust and share. And, and that kind of nonverbal communication counts almost as much as the therapeutic process with the talking. And so it's important, it's important. And I encourage you, if you're struggling with anxiety, depression, things like that, find a good counselor. Find someone that you can share with where you can uh, have that, okay? You see, here at Emotional Resilience, you, you and I are key to healing. What we can do for other people is have that positive self-regard. We can have that, that, that loving attunement with them and communicate non-verbally to them that they're important to us, that we're glad to be with them that they matter, that they're significant. We're the communicators of that. Just like a parent should be to a child, we can be that with each other. And why? Because we know that today, this attachment process can continue. It can continue as an adult. And I'll never forget when I heard Dan Siegel share that. I was at UCLA in California, and he was sharing with us how that there's now we know that uh, we can have secure attachments as an adult. And I thought, oh, my goodness. It's like hitting a do-over button. It's like hitting a do-over button. And the truth is, that's what my wife has done for me. She helped me. And I'll get into that in a few minutes. You see, change happens when we feel safe, when we build up that, when we can uh, have that safety, and when we can have that attunement and communication with others. It, when, it, when you have this emotional bond, because that's what attachment is. And it's important that we have this kind of fellowship with each other where we can see that, you know, we can help each other grow just by being there, being empath empathic with them. And so that's important. Attachment simply defined as emotional bond between people, and that's where change happens. Our right brains communicate much faster than our verbal communication. And when we attune to each other, we speak volumes to the other person's right brain to right brain. It's speech on steroids, right? You know, for example, which affects you more? Uh, someone saying that they like you or someone that's saying it and showing it with their facial expression and their body language? I mean, have you ever had that? The person that sits there and, and does one of these things, you know, like this, folds their arms and tapping their foot and looking like this, he said, no, no, take your time, it's okay, I'm in no hurry. You know, what's wrong with that picture? You know, everything about them says they're aggravated, they're in a hurry, and yet they're trying to be nice and tell you to take your time. Have you ever had that experience where someone's telling you something, and yet their body's telling you something different? Well, we listen to the body, don't we? Which was more believable, take your time, or the foot tapping and the arms crossed and the look on my face? You knew which one to believe. You better hurry, because they mean it. Yet they say they don't. So, so body language speaks volumes, speaks volumes. And that's what children understood. You know, there was an experiment where they put uh, the e, uh, EEGs on both the mother and the baby. And when they were communicating and looking, you've seen that, right? A mother with a baby and how they gaze at each other and ooh, and they talk back and forth. When they were in that gaze, when they were doing that kind of emotional regulation, both brain waves were the same. They were identical. They were in sync. Their brain waves were in sync. They've done another experiment with a mother and child. They put a mother in one room, a closed room, with a video camera and a TV monitor. And they put the baby in the bay car seat kind of thing, had it on the table and had a camera on the baby and a monitor. And the baby, after a minute or two, was kind of getting uncomfortable, wondering where his mother, and starts going, Ma, you know, kind of whimpering and that. And the mother got it, you know, had the microphone and the camera and was saying, oh, there, honey, hey, honey, it's okay, mama's here, it's okay, and looking at her, smiling. And, and the baby saw the monitor heard the tone of voice, saw the facial expression, and was able to what? Calm down, calm down. 
even though it was a TV, a, a monitor, and a microphone. But what's interesting is that they recorded that. And so what they did is when the baby, uh, you know, they turned it off and the baby after a few minutes again was a little uncomfortable where his mom, right, and starts doing the same thing, they just hit the, rec hit the play button. And instead of the mom uh, doing it this time, they just played the recording. And guess what? The baby was not soothed. The baby was not soothed. Even though it was the mother's face, the mother's voice, it wasn't in sync. See, there wasn't that reciprocal communication going on. It wasn't in sync. And, I, you know, that shows that this attunement is eye to eye. You know, it's timed. It's timely, right? There's an in sync part to it. And uh, that's kind of really, really fascinating. As adults, if we're going to have an attachment, we need another person's mature brain to communicate with our right brain. And so they have to feel good in their own skin. They need to have uh, had healthy attachments. They need to be secure so they can communicate that to us. I mean, if we're hanging around someone that's uh, venting all the time and angry all the time, what's that going to communicate? That's not going to help us mature, is it? And you've been around adults like that, people you feel uncomfortable about, people that you got to walk on eggshells. So that's not a mature mind working with yours. If we're going to become mature, we need mature minds. And the goal in this class is that all of us would mature. We're all at different levels, but we all want to constantly grow, right? And mature. And as we're in the maturing process, and we're doing those kind of things that help us mature, we'll be communicating and encouraging that in each other. And so that's important. And so it's in, it, you know, we want to try with our love, our warmth, our communication, our safety, our caring, and our spirituality to really communicate to others how much they're loved, how valuable they are. And you know what? When we do that, it usually comes back to us. And there's this healthy exchange, this mutual maturity going on. And, you know, in a sense, let's be a missionary of God's love and maturity for each other. Okay? Let's look at page two here. I have an exercise. Uh, we can't do that necessarily on a camera here. But if you're with someone, you might want to go ahead and try that. But let's look at how to show people that you're happy to be with them, right? This is, we talked about social engagement last time. And this is part of that social engagement system. The face, the body language, the voice, all that, the ears, all those are part of that social engagement system. And we can show someone that we're happy to be with them uh, by our on eye contact, our facial communication, the warmth, right, our voice, tone of voice, appropriate touch, and even with our words, words of appreciation. And it's really important. You know, I remember... <clears throat> Uh, when I had teenage boys, I was all of a sudden going to have three at the same time, but I, I had two and one was coming up. And I was really concerned about raising teenage boys. And so I was reading this one book uh, by a Christian psychologist, and he was talking about uh, what you can do to help uh, have this bond. And I didn't know the terms, you know, back then, attachment or any of that stuff. But what I do remember is he said, every day, be purposeful every day to look them in the eye, make good eye contact, give them an affirming touch, an appropriate touch, and tell them that you love them. And you know, that was three easy things. And I determined in my mind that I was going to start doing that. And so I'd try every day if I could come up and say, hey, uh, Ryan, you know, look at me, yeah, I love you. You know, I'm so happy to be with you. And I'm so glad I'm your dad, or whatever, whatever the thing was that I wanted to communicate there. And that kind of stuff, that, that uh, uh, affirming look, right, the, the tone of voice, the smile, all that stuff that says you're important, that you matter, that I, I, I love you, if that's the case, that you're with someone like that. All that kind of communication is invaluable. And it can't be just fate, you know? There's a difference between being happy to see someone and posing, right? I mean, we've all posed for pictures. Okay, let's pose. Say cheese. Right? And we get a pose. And, and if we were here all together, I'd be showing you pictures of the difference where you see kids posing and when a baby's really happy, and, oh, there's mom. 
right? And the whole look is altogether different. It's spontaneous. It's, it's big. You can imitate it somewhat, but there's sudden nuances, uh, subtle nuances that, that can show you the difference, right? And so we know when we're not posing. We know when it's genuine. And so here again, we can sometimes say, Lord, help me have more love. Lord, help me have your love for other people. It's his desire that we love one another. Well, let's just take a minute. In this environment today, uh, when, when there's so much stuff, negative stuff going around, what are we talking about when we say appropriate touch? <laughs> you know, and so I've outlined just a few things. It should be a response uh, to the person's need for comforting or encouragement or affection. And it should be based on their needs, not mine. It's not my need so much to smother them and say, oh, I love you and all that. What, how am I responding to their need? How, and, and so number two, we should not force it. Just because there's a need there uh, doesn't mean we can just go in there and give an appropriate touch. Physical contact should always be with the person's consent. For example, uh, uh, and the approved adult may say, hey, can I give you a hug? You know, obviously, if you already established a relationship and have exercised healthy, appropriate touch, you don't need to be so formal. But, uh, hey, do you mind if I just, you know, and it could be a side hug, you know, hey. Uh, but you know how that is with people, and you know whether you need to ask permission or not at the time, okay? And a physical touch should gen generally, especially with children, be uh, limited to contact with maybe the hand or the shoulder, right? Uh, maybe a pat on the upper back. Uh, and, uh, you know, and then if it's appropriate and you have the relationship, it can be hugs. But uh, never, never without the, uh, if the person's not feeling comfortable and if you don't really have a good relationship. And, and another thing here, number four, uh, a person's verbal or nonverbal no <laughs> should always be respected. I mean, you know, if, if someone's upset and, and they're not ready to be, you know, given an affirmative touch, right? Respect that. Respect that. If they pull away, uh, that's okay. That's okay. Respect their wishes. And so we, we talked about that, and you can read that, but I think it's just important in today's environment. It's important that we have appropriate touch. We need that kind of communication, but we need to be sensitive to others, okay? Well, let's talk a little bit about attach attachment theory on page three here. Attachment is emotional bond between people. Attachment theory, then, is about the relationship between the children and their caregivers. That's what the theory was about. Uh, John Bowlby was the one that came up with it. In 1958, he presented a major work, and it shocked the world, right? It wasn't well received at first because he was a psychoanalyst and everyone was saying, what are you studying that for? But it was revolutionary. It was revolutionary. And, and this is key. Um, in the 1990s, the decade of the brain with all the new neuroscience uh, that has led to the fact uh, that while child attachment styles are real, there, uh, that there is now a belief that a person can acquire secure attachments later in life. Today, attachment theory combined with neuroscience is the fastest growing theory in all of trauma uh, therapy. And what the good news is we know now not only uh, can we have attachment as children, but if something went wrong, and you know, probably half the country hasn't, doesn't have a you know, secure attachment, it's not too late. And that's, it's interesting. You know, that's why I love Christianity. Christianity is for when we kind of get older, right, and mature. As a, you know, we can receive Christ as a, a young child, and I get that, and I understand that. But still, as we become more rational, we need to make sure that, that that decision in our own mind is something that we live by. It's not about eternal security. It's about are we serious? Is he the Lord of our life? You know, uh, do we really want to follow him? And, of course, then as an adult, we usually make that affirmation, yes, I do, right? And what's so interesting is that we have God the Father, and, and we can be reparented. If things weren't the way they should have been in the first place, now we have this relationship with God, the Father, and he can refather us. And all that love and understanding and things that we should have gotten from a father, we can get from God. And, and then when you look at the role of the Holy Spirit, 
there's a lot of maternal things there, right? The comforting, the caring, uh, the, uh, watching over us and uh, praying on our behalf and all these things. You know, we can be almost like remothered, right? And then we have siblings. We have fellowship with each other. So it's really exciting, Christianity. You know, it's interesting, Jesus said, born again. <laughs> and I know he was talking about spiritually being born again, but when you think about it, we come into a whole new family. And now we're doing it not as a helpless child, although we have some of those helpless children-type thoughts in us, we can now use that rational part of our brain that's come online from 12 to about 22 or 3, and now we can use that rational part of our brain, communicate with God, and be reparented at a much faster pace and start to really be all that God has called us to be. And so we can have that. We can have that healthy, healthy attachment. Well, I go on and I talk a little bit more about it, and you can go ahead and, and look and finish up page 3. Um, if you don't have the notes, I can certainly send them to you. You can contact me at ron at empowerministry.org. That's ron at empowerministry.org. And just to put in there notes um, on attachment, or if you want to be on the email list, because I send them out, you can also be on our email list. But let's, let's continue this theme about uh, attachment as an adult, okay? Let's look at page four here. Now, I start attachment as an adult, and I said, now we know that not all is lost if a child fails to have a secure, healthy attachment with their caregivers. And next week, in the next couple of weeks, we'll be talking about uh, the different attachment styles, what happens as a child. And, and we'll be talking about some of the negative, or you might say, attachment styles that aren't as healthy for us and that many of us struggle with. And here I'm saying, the good news is we can change that. We can change our attitudes about people. We can change our attitudes about ourselves. We can change uh, our behavior. We can have a healthy attachment. It's possible to have a, a secure attachment, which in an adult it's called earned uh, attachment with other adults. And that's what happened to me. Uh, you know my story, how I, I was a phobic child, had anxiety even in my uh, 20s and up until the early 30s. But it was my wife who uh, was able to be this secure person that I could come back to. I could be myself with. I could be depressed around. I could be anxious around. And she loved me and accepted me and had that positive self-regard toward me and that attunement. And she tried to understand the best she could and was patient. And, and because of that love of hers, I started developing a more secure attachment, not just toward her, but toward other people. And I started believing things about myself that were positive and not so negative. And, and so that can happen to us. And I'm a living testimony of that. And it's so exciting to know uh, that it's not too late. It's not too late. That's why uh, when we resume this class together, it's important. That's why I like sitting around round tables where we can start to build those relationships, where we can come together week after week and have this kind of relationship and pour into each other and be happy to be with each other. And so how do we do this attach, attachment? Attachments through the senses, and it relays to the prefrontal cortex. Uh, the attachment dialogue has been documented by infant researchers, among them psychiatrist Daniel Stern. And it's really fascinating. They've taken, uh, you know, frame after frame after frame after frame after frame and showed the attachment between the, the mother and the father, this dance, if you will, the look and the look in the mother and then the look at the child and the body language. And it's really fascinating. They've done exhaustive studies on how this works. They were the first one to document second by second nuances. Their photograph sequences reveal mother and infant face to face. Uh, their gazes interlocking and their expressions modeling and mirroring one another. Uh, by tuning into every subtle shift of the infant states, the caregiver accentuates positive states of excitement, joy, and pleasure and minimizes distress. And that's what, that's, what, that's what attachment does. That's why that social engagement we talked about last week was so important. God wants us, he wired us to have these kind of relationships. And who better than in this Christian fellowship where we can really have it together. 
So attachment begins at conception. It becomes at conception. And it's what Dan Siegel calls the infant feeling felt, feeling felt. And that's why when we start talking about uh, emotional recognition, we're, we're, we're having these emotional issues going on. We're not sure why. We know we're being triggered, and so we regulate it. But if we're going to change it, if we're going to change it, then we have to emotionally relearn. And how do we do that? We do that by all of a sudden coming in awareness. What's going on here? What am I feeling? What am I believing? What's, what's going on? And, and these are called felt beliefs. You see, what we feel here, these sensations, they're caused by beliefs. I'm no good. I'm in trouble, and therefore I'll die. <laughs> you know, uh, no one likes me. I'll be abandoned. These are felt beliefs. They're in the body, and they're felt beliefs. And so what happens uh, is that in this attachment, we can start to learn new felt beliefs. Felt beliefs like I'm secure. I'm safe, I'm significant, I'm loved. Those are primal needs that we have. Those are things that we should have grown up with. Every one of us should know how significant we are, how loved we are, how safe we are. And that's where we can start getting this from God, right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I shall not have any needs, right? He makes me lie down beside still waters, right? Listen to the love and the safety that's in that. And we need that from each other. We need that from each other. And so uh, there's that bonding stage in that early zero to eight months bonding stage with a mother and a father. And attachment bonding lays a foundation for experiencing close relationships by creating. Now listen, by, and this is on the bottom of four, last paragraph. By creating a template for all sub subsequent relationships. There's this template made. You know, if, you, if you're an infant and all of a sudden you touch a hot stove, you're not going to touch other hot stoves. Now, what's interesting, the amygdala will see the whole stove. The, the hippocampus will see the hot burners. And so you'll probably know that I can't go near the hot burners. And, and, and there's, it's going to be hard to talk a baby into doing that as they grow up, right? Because they learn that. Pain, that's pain. Well, some of our relationships were painful. And so we learn to avoid. That's one of the reactions, avoidance, right? Or we try extra hard, you know, to really, really please, please, please love me, right? Or we're all confused. And we'll talk about those kind next week. But that's, that's what happens. And this template is made early on. And subsequent relationships kind of fall in that template. Now, they can contradict it. And we can have a healthy attachment. And now it gets contradicted. And that's what happens. It, it isn't that we can't relearn. But you've got to remember, the parents are pretty consistent here. And so by the time a child starts growing up, coming into adulthood, these have been long, long established uh, templates. And so uh, the good news is, and why I love teaching this uh, to the church, is that there's hope today. There's hope today. We can do this. We can be different. God, that's why, you know, at 20, your life isn't over unless God takes you home. But normally you have another what? 50, 60, 70 years. And so there's time. There's time to make these changes. And it's worth it, isn't it? It's worth it. You're worth it. You're worth it. And you need to find, Lord, help me. How can I have these healthy attachments with you and with each other where I can start believing who I am? And how do we do that? How do we communicate that? On page five here, we do it with our tone of voice, our facial expression, with a proper kind of touch by listening, with eye contact. And if we feel it, we sense it in the body. We feel it in our gut. We feel it in our gut. We feel it around our heart, right? And we feel it in our face. And we know that this is a good thing and that they're ha happy to be with me and I'm loved, and I'm secure. And that's a gift. 
And part of what we need to take on as a, as a Christian and as a human being that one of my goals is to help others feel that way by really loving people, by really caring for them, by getting out of myself and caring for others. And it starts at home. It starts at home. Well, let's, let's look at page six here. Healthy attachments and attunement with God. Because uh, this is the thing. God created us. He wired us this way. He created this system, not me. God created this human being body, right, with all this ability to have this social engagement. He created this system. It's so marvelous, so marvelous. God is so creative. And he's given us a system not only that we can communicate with each other, but we can communicate with him. And we don't have to wait for others to have healthy attachments. You can start right now uh, with uh, the Heavenly Father, like I said earlier, with the Heavenly Father. Get your relationship straight with him. Know that Jesus Christ died on a cross for you and that, that all the uh, wrongdoing you've done can be totally forgiven. You can have this clean, new relationship with God and that he loves you. He loves you so much that he gave his son to be your savior, right? And so you can have this relationship with him. And so you can come to him and confess and say, Lord, and have this clean slate. Paul writes this, when we, when we or anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person, the old life is gone, a new life has begun. Uh, Apostle John says, all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become the children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. And so we're in this new family now, and this reparenting, and this whole new attachment process can go on. And when we accept Christ as our Savior, we become a child of God, right? He becomes our father, uh, not a father with human frailty, but an almighty, benevolent, loving father. Paul says this, I will live in them, that he's referring to God, I will, God is saying, I will live in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. I will be your father and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Isn't that thrilling? It's so exciting. God created you for himself before you were ever procreated. <laughs> he created you. Therefore, you can claim him as your parent and begin to be reparent, and you can begin to attune with him. Now, Leanne Payne talks a little bit about this in her book, Restoring the Christian Soul. And I'm going to read it to you, and you can read along. We're on page six. She says, the reason so few come out of puberty and adolescence having accepted themselves has to do with the breakup of the home. I mean, we're, it's an epidemic now the impaired ability of mothers to nurture their infants, and the absence of whole affirming fathers. Additionally, in the social environment of today, with its overheated, even pornographic media, which gives all the wrong connotations of what love is, right? It's autonomous, uh, uh, autonomous and thoroughly secularized public schools and its culture actively hostile to this Judeo-Christian morality and values, young people are called out from under their parents' influence before they, uh, the necessary affirmation is even set in. And so schools have taken upon themselves to uh, parent children. Uh, their, the peer pressure starts coming in, the society, the things that were, children are on the computer all the time, on the phone, they're watching the screens, and, and it's, not, it's not the parents, it's not us that are doing all this stuff, and we're allowing it, and so children are growing up without the healthy kind of attachment that they need. And so she says uh, the result is the peer groups and psychological harm from drugs, sex, and violence often shape the self-image. And she says the answer is found in God's affirmation of us. And she says this, it is in the love and affirmation of those around us as we are growing up that we gain a reasonably self-assured view of ourselves. In one sense, we cannot overstate, we cannot overstate the importance of the loving acceptance 
and affirmation we need in order to accept ourselves. I mean, she's talking exactly about what we've been talking about today. In another sense, this affirmation is never fully adequate, though, to get the job done. Even if the love is there, the rejections we experience in a fallen world can hold us back from being able to receive it until we are healed. We must eventually turn to the master affirmer, the master affirmer, God who created us himself, God the Father, our true identity and our real authentic selves. He knows what is. He created our true authentic selves. He heals the unaffirmed by sending his affirmed word, his love for us, right? And we must, we must all receive this. Those who are psychologically healthy due to affirmation on a natural plane, as well as those who are deprived of that. We are all affirmed in a higher sense, unaffirmed, I mean. We are all unaffirmed in a higher sense until we find ourselves complete in him. So it's this attunement with God, isn't it? He says, no one else can ever accept me for me or you for you. All of us must confess our pride and then receive the healing word from God in order to accept ourselves. It is imperative that we begin earnestly listening to God the Father the one who waits to bring us out of our fearful, dependent relationships and into right relationships with himself and others. This will occur quite naturally as we spread out before him every diseased thought and attitudinal period, uh, pattern. Then as his precious chosen ones, we listen and receive the truth and reality he gives to replace them. That is how we bring dysfunctional, sinful, prideful patterns in the thought life, in the imagination, in the submission to Christ. It is in this way that the fleshly and demonic strongholds in the mind and imagination are torn down. What she's saying is that every one of us have these thoughts about ourselves, have things that we maybe uh, shouldn't be doing and thinking. We can bring these to God. We can trust him. We can say, God, help me. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's uh, some uh, unhealthy thoughts. Maybe it's some depressive thinking. You know, we can bring those to God. We don't have to play. We don't have to pretend. We can be safe with him. And we can hear him say to us how much he loves us and forgives us and accepts us. He's the ultimate affirmer. He's the ultimate forgiver. Who else can forgive you of everything you've ever done? Who else can forgive you for those things and, and has your best interest in mind, wants you to be everything you can be and knows where you are right now? He knows. He knows the struggles. He knows how many times we've tried. He knows the thinking that goes on. We, we don't have to hide. And we come to him with it. We lay it out before him. We start listening. We read his word. We study. We have Christian fellowship. We have attunement with each other. And we start to mature. We start to grow. And there's a prayer I have here. And, and why don't we close with this prayer, and then I'll just uh, close with a few announcements. And, and you can look at the prayer on page 7, and you can pray along with it. Dear Father, I thank you for creating me as a lovable person, one whom you love and adore. Help me believe that emotionally deep in my heart. Help me see in my mind you looking at me with favor, kindness, and love. Because of your son, Jesus, I can come to you and give you all my emotions, feelings, and thoughts, knowing that Christ is ready to take them and give me back in exchange for the truth about who I am. Empower me, Holy Father, to renounce all lies about myself, all self-hatred that I have, and help me move toward wholly accepting my true identity as your child and you as my lo true, loving, affirming Father. In Jesus' name, amen. And take that prayer and read it, chew it, and then pray it from the bottom of your heart and ask him to help you because he will not turn you away. He won't. Well, 
we're going down this. We'll talk more about attachments next week. You know, if you want more of this, you can uh, go to a Mr. Change Agent Facebook page, Mr. Change Agent YouTube channel. We have videos. We have other things. We have books. Uh, you can go to Amazon, look under Ronald Ovid. That's Ronald Ovid, and you can see some of the books that we have. I encourage you to uh, communicate. If you have questions of that, ron at empowerministry.org. I'd be happy to share with you, okay? And, you know, we also, this time of the year is when people start looking at habits and wanting change, and we have a, a book uh, called Downtime Temptations along with a free class, video class, that you can have. You can get that book at www.empowerforliving. Dot com forward slash downtime. That's www.empowerforliving.com forward slash downtime. And if you want to complete it, downtime dash temptations if you want, but downtime should be enough. All right, and we'll send you that free book and you can sign up for the video class as well. All right, so God bless you. Thanks for coming and we'll get together again next time.